Good morning. Thanks for tuning in to Harbor Cove Online. If you're checking us out for the first time, we want you to know that we also have two campuses in Gig Harbor that meet on Sunday mornings. You can check out our website, harborcove.church, for more information about who we are and what to expect if you join us in person. This morning, we are continuing our series called Grow. In this series, we are going to look at the most basic and practical ways you can grow your faith. Any growth, though, comes from an identity in Jesus. One way we can explore that identity is by following Jesus' calling on our lives through prayer. And that's what we are going to explore this morning and challenge you to take a next step in your prayer practice. Our service is about to start. Settle in and get ready to worship, and thanks for joining us at Harbor Cove Online.
Well, good morning. You know, I love singing that word need. I think it's a word that we often say when we don't really need to. There's just so many times we say, oh, I just, oh, I need some coffee, or I need to, I need a five-minute break, or something like that. But do we really need those things? But I love proclaiming that we do have a need for Jesus, a need for a Savior, a need that, and a recognition that we, we're not perfect, and we're not here to, you know, to just flaunt how great we are, but instead, we're here recognizing that we're in need of a Savior, and we get to worship Him, and that's why we do, because He is worthy of all the glory and praise and honor and admiration. So I want to invite you now to read these words responsively with me. Come into this sacred space to worship God. Whose teaching is perfect, whose directions are sure. Come into this holy place to worship God. Whose commandment is clear, whose judgments are true. Come with holy fear, to be given life and made wise, to have your heart stirred and your eyes opened wide. Let the words of our mouths and the whisperings of our hearts be according to your will, O God. Amen. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. 
So hear these words from First Chronicles. It's so great seeing a song, uh, seeing a song in the Bible uh, that's not in the Psalms. So King David sings this before a greater king, God. It says this, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. The words from this song come from Psalm 34.
and I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy. be seated. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, we do love you. It is good to gather together to pray and worship as one body with the assurance that you are present with us. Lord, as we look outside on these cold winter days, everything looks dormant. Yet underneath the cold ground, there is life ready to burst forth when the spring season comes. Just as we can rely on the changing of the seasons that you have created, we can rely on the fact that you are working all around us, even when we don't have the vision to see immediate change. God, it is discouraging to be bombarded with constant news of injustices and violence in the world. Let us not give up praying for peace, and in particular, for people who are at the mercy of the atrocities of wars or those who live under oppressive regimes. We take solace in the words of Daniel 2.21 that God you alone determine the course of world events. Lord, today I pray for anyone who feels unseen or ignored or lonely. Give them the confidence to know that they are vital and loved for who they are. For those who are exhausted, stressed, or overwhelmed by life events, I pray, Lord, that you would refresh their spirits with your grace and give them a new perspective. God, we all have challenges in our lives, times that we are brought to our knees, praying for your strength to carry us. Lord, remind us of your promise that you will not leave us nor forsake us, whether we are in the valleys or on the mountaintops. Lord, it is easy to fill our days with activities that cause us to be distracted, not allowing time with you in prayer. Help us to discern between the demands that masquerade as urgent needs and those that are truly necessary. Lord, give us the desire to create space in our day for solitude and time with you in prayer. It is through those t quiet times of prayer that we are drawn closer to you and able to see lasting transformation in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the people who have been instrumental in our faith journey, bringing us to where we are today. As Michael preached last week, we have been called individually to be part of this church body, each with unique gifts. Lord, help us to share our gifts and service to our church and our community, not to gain attention or accolades, but because our faith in Jesus compels us to follow the example he has given for us. Now would you join me in saying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi. I'm Josh, and these are the three things you need to know 
this week. Number one, towels and linens. During the month of February, we are collecting bath towels, hand towels, washcloths, and bed sheets for the Northwest Furniture Bank in Tacoma. The Northwest Furniture Bank helps restore hope, dignity, and stability in our community by recycling donated furniture to people in need. But you might be going, wait, towels and sheets aren't furniture. You're right, they aren't. But one of the cool things Harbor Cove has been doing has been trying to gather those extra items needed for a home. So when clients are able to get the furniture they need, it also comes with some extra needed stuff. This has been a huge blessing to families in need. So, will you help us? Head to Target, Costco, Kohl's, or your local Amazon app and get some towels or linens and drop them off at the church on Sundays or in the office during the week. Number two, kids camp. Look, we know it's still cold and wet outside, but that doesn't mean we can't still plan for sunnier days. So let's talk summer for a minute. We know vacation plans are being made and things need to get booked, so we wanted to give you a heads up for when our kids camp is being scheduled. Kids camp this year is August 12th through 16th. It's for kids who are currently in elementary school this school year. So yes, that means if your kiddo is still in fifth grade this year, they can still participate. The theme this year is called Start the Party. Jesus gives us the most amazing reason to party. That's why we believe God's love and the gospel of Jesus is the best news ever. So plan to have your kids ready for the best week of the summer. Registration and volunteer signups won't open until Easter Sunday on March 31st, but now you can hopefully block off August 12th through 16th to spend it right here with us. Number three, fun fact. Hawaiian pizza was invented in Canada by a Greek immigrant at his restaurant that served American Chinese food. Hmm, interesting. And those are the three things you need to know this week. If you have any questions, visit harborcove.church or stop by the welcome counter in the gathering place. today is a big day for playoff football and my San Francisco 49ers. I want to talk about baseball. You, you, you might find it shocking that I am also a fan of the San Francisco Giants. I know that's kind of a big deal, but um, I've been a fan since my childhood. Here's a picture uh, to prove it. In 2010, 2012, 2014 were great years to be a fan. They won the World Series. And I was even an extra in one of their commercials in 2011. You can't see me, but I'm right here holding this sign. Before those years, though, it was rough. They hadn't won a World Series since 1958 when they still played in New York. And I remember them losing to the Oakland A's in 1989 and then losing again to the Los Angeles Angels in 2002. And I was convinced, though, that year that they were going to win in 2002. They were so close. They had such a great team. They were only about eight outs away from the championship, but they ended up losing because of this thing, the rally monkey. The rally monkey is kind of hard to explain. It's kind of like a mascot for the Angels, although it only appears on the video on the screen. And if the Angels are tied or they're losing toward the end of the game, the big, the big screen at the stadium will play a movie clip starring the rally monkey. And he jumps around and he pumps up the crowd and he hopefully motivates the Angels toward a comeback victory against whatever team that they're playing. And that may sound strange to all of you, but it freaking worked. In game six of the World Series, the Angels trailed the, the Giants five to nothing in like the seventh inning. And they were on the brink of elimination. The Giants were about ready to win the World Series and the rally monkey appeared on the screen. And a few pitches later, this guy named Scott Spezio hit a three run home run that sparked a comeback. Uh, they wound up scoring three more runs in the eighth inning to win the game and then would go on to win the next game and beat the Giants in the World Series. 
And it's been a tradition in LA ever since. The angels, when they're struggling or on the verge of failure, they call upon the rally monkey to save the day. So why am I talking about this? So you can feel my pain? Probably, there was a painful moment. But you can also look at it this way. We can see the rally monkey as the things that angel fans call upon when the team's in trouble and it needs something, needs some help from something bigger than themselves. And we see this pattern everywhere else in the world too. People who come upon a problem and they can't figure out what to do themselves, so they seek out the help of something that is greater than themselves. They go to a people or person or even a Google search um, and they, someone who has the right abilities to solve their problem or, uh, or and then they petition the person or those people for their help. Essentially, they're saying, I have this problem. I'm not strong enough, talented enough, influential enough, smart enough to figure this out on my own. Will you please help me? And I think this is a good place to start when we think about the topic of prayer. We've been spending some time looking at practical ways we can grow in our faith. We've looked at being in community and we've looked at being on mission. And this morning we're going to look at uh, practicing prayer. And I think prayer is easy to understand as a thing that we do when we have a problem, when we don't feel strong enough or talented enough, influential enough, smart enough to figure it out. And whether you go to church each week or this is one of the your first times checking out a church service, you've most likely heard, seen, experienced, or even said prayers. It's one of those things, one of those Christian-y things that religious people seem to talk about and do all the time. But as common as prayer is, it can be a bit confusing sometimes. Have you ever thought about why we bow our heads and close our eyes when we pray? The Bible, there's actually more examples of people praying while standing and with their eyes open, their hands raised to the sky than with their heads bowed. Also, what are we supposed to say during a prayer? Like, how long should we pray for? These are, these are all big questions. First, a little confession, though, before we continue. I'm not an expert prayer in any shape or form. In fact, this is an area of growth for me, for sure. Just because I'm here speaking um, doesn't mean that I've got this prayer thing figured out. In fact, I got a lot of questions. It's actually, I struggle with prayer. When I sit down and I try to pray, my mind refuses to be still. I feel like nothing I've prayed for makes any sense sometimes, and that's why I have come to love like written down prayers that I can just read and pray through. And I've had some really great experiences with prayer, and I've had some really disappointing ones with prayer as well. And I'm in awe of people that have great prayer lives, and I feel um, they feel like they hear God's voice guiding them in their prayer times. And, and I also understand the struggle of feeling like God isn't really there and you might just be talking to your own thoughts. So, it, so that's where I'm at. And I just want to encourage you to be honest with yourself this morning as we get into the practice of prayer and finding out how it can help us grow as people who follow Jesus. So let's get started with these verses from Colossians 4, 2 through 4. This little section is from a letter we have from Paul who wrote to the church in the city of Colossae. I think that's how you say it. Don't quote me. Um, and he asked them to pray for him. Now, a little bit of background here. Paul is writing this letter from prison. He's in prison for inducing riots and publicly opposing the laws and customs of the day. Now, here's the deal. Paul was a man who was commissioned to persecute early Christians and ultimately stop the spread of Jewish people converting to Christianity. Until he had a pretty epic conversion experience himself, and he switched sides. He took up the same zeal he had against Christians, and he focused it on helping the early church grow instead. And so you can imagine the enemies that he made in this moment. There were some uh, they, things were tense, and his, his opponents would always be on the lookout to try to lock him up. It's recorded that his riot charges uh, happened after he healed a demon-possessed wo slave woman who was being used as a crazy, mysterious fortune teller uh, to make a profit for her owners. And it's recorded that it, when he healed her, the woman wasn't useful anymore to, their, to her owners, and it affected the bottom line. So uh, Paul's accusers accused him of starting a riot, even though he di it didn't happen, and they had him thrown in jail. The second arrest happened when his opponents got too fed up with his mission to help Christians grow a uh, church in their area, and they had him thrown in prison just to shut him up. And it's from this context that Paul writes these words, Colossians 4, 2 through 4. 
He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So here we have Paul in need of a rally monkey, basically. And in a situation where he needs some help outside of himself, and he turns to prayer and he encourages his friends to pray for him, to pray for um, the uh, alertness to see what God is doing, to pray with thankfulness for what God is doing, and to pray that the message of the gospel, which is Jesus' death and resurrection, will be shared despite the hurdles that they're facing. But this isn't the only story or call to prayer that we stumble upon when we read through the Bible. The Bible actually has 650-ish prayers, and about 25 of them are recorded prayers of Jesus. There are prayers of faith, prayers that, affirm, that, uh, that reaffirm faith in God and His will. There's prayers of agreement, which are prayers where groups of people get together to pray for the same thing. Our, our prayer time right before our sermons would be something like this. There's also prayers of petition, prayers where we petition God or ask God for something, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers that show our gratitude of what God has done, prayers of worship, which are prayers that help us recognize God's power and greatness, prayers of consecration, prayers where we declare something holy and set it aside for God, prayers of intercession, where we pray for someone else's well-being in a certain situation, and prayers of the Holy Spirit. And this one is cool. Romans 8, we're told that in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. This one's pretty rad. And it basically says, if you don't know what to pray for, that's okay because the God of the universe has you covered. From the stories of the Bible... We're encouraged to pray from any position too, like physically, but it specifically mentions five postures that can your body can uh, help you get into a prayerful spirit. There's sitting uh, as a way of sitting at the feet of God. There's bowing as a sign of loyalty and allegiance. There's kneeling as a sign of surrender. There's lifting hands as a sign of acceptance. And there's prostrating. It's a fun word, but it basically means lying flat on the ground with your face downward as a sign of the highest devotion. So prayer is like a Christian's rally monkey, but it's so much more than just asking for victory. And it's encouraged, and it, it's to be encouraged to use in more situations other than when you're in a bind. We actually have a great opportunity for you to grow through the practice of prayer and explore the depths of what a solid prayer life can look like. In February on Monday nights, we have a class called Practicing Prayer, Pastor Mark, our North Campus pastor, is leading it here at Central Campus. And for four weeks, we're going to talk about um, how to talk to God, how to talk with God, how to listen to God, and how to be with God. And I'll kind of give the Cliff Notes versions of that here later. But I highly encourage you to sign up for it um, and do it or visit uh, practicingtheway.com and figure out a way to do it on your own. Um, and like I said, I'm also going to kind of give you some simple practices you can do here later. But this is a great opportunity this next month to, to practice prayer. Because I think if we can grow as a church in our prayer practices, we can be changed. Now notice that I didn't say if we grow in our prayer practices as a church, we can change things. I said we can be changed. And again, I'm not an expert prayer here, um, and so I could be way wrong, and I'm happy to listen to you if you think I am. But I get a lot of red flags when I hear things like, if we don't pray for change, then nothing will change. Or if we don't pray for the enemy, uh, pray against the enemy, then he'll do this or that and the enemy will win. The, the story of the gospel is that Jesus has already won and that Jesus is at work despite what we do or don't do. And so when prayer begins to feel like it's this, this weapon that we use, I, I get a little uneasy. And I know there's a verse that says like, if, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain but I haven't heard of any mountains moving um, lately, and I know a lot of faithful people. And so I, I, I think that means a little bit something different. And I think if we reduce prayer down to just a transaction where we pray and something happens because of our faith, I think we miss the point of a broader and more beautiful gift of prayer. And here's how my brain works. If I pray for a promotion um, and, uh, or some blessing of some kind, and I get it, 
And I believe, man, God must love me. But if my friend prays for a, a promotion, a blessing of some kind, and doesn't get it, the next question is, well, why? Why me and not them? Did I do something wrong? Uh, or did they do something wrong? Did I do something right? Did they not believe enough? Does God have favorites? And what about when we have the same requests for a loved one who is going through some like medical need? Like sometimes after praying for a medical miracle, we get them and sometimes we don't. Like I've prayed for um, the healing of my daughter and we have found it. And I've prayed for the healing of my father and we haven't found it. Is, is that all prayer comes down to is what hit, hits and what misses? I think if our prayer becomes just a wish list of promotions and healings and lost keys and parking spots and good weather, our, our faith in God doesn't grow, but it instead withers into using God as like a vending machine. Put in the right prayer and out pops your treat. And, and of course, we're encouraged to pray for what we need. Jesus even re is recorded saying in John 14, 13, like, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. But does that mean that if I pray for the 49ers to win their game today in Jesus' name, that's going to happen? To God be the glory? I'm pretty sure that the prayers of the opponents, well, there's a lot more for the Detroit Lions that are pretty loud today as well. What if they pray in Jesus' name? As I've read through scripture, God seems to be calling his people to pray in deeper ways um, than just, and, and, that's, and I've noticed something, that prayer doesn't necessarily change things. More often than not, prayer changes people, and people change things. Mother Teresa, uh, the, a saint of a human, a Catholic nun, and founder of the Missionaries of Charity, uh, once said that I used to pray that God would feed the hungry or do this or that, but now I pray that he will guide me to do whatever I'm supposed to do, what I can do. I used to pray for answers, but now I'm praying for strength. I used to believe that prayer changes things, but now I know that prayer changes us and we change things. And I think the best prayer that we can pray before praying anything else might be what's called the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer, according to many church fathers of early Christianity, is essential to spiritual maturity. The, uh, the Jesus prayer declares our faith, and it humbles us by requesting mercy for our sinfulness. The Jesus prayer is believed to be as old as the church itself, and it goes something like this. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The beauty of this prayer is its simplicity. It's the first and the last prayer we should probably pray in our lifetimes, and it's probably wise to pray it often in between. And it's a prayer that, to, that changes us from the core of who we are, to change us from sinner to saved. We met as a staff in the fall on a little day retreat, and we started out our time with this prayer together. We spent five minutes just repeating this over and over in our heads. And after a while, it felt like a tune that got stuck in my head. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Then I already told you how my brain works. At this point, it's hard to focus. And this, this, the, um, this rhythm started to sound like one of those lines from You're Welcome in Moana, which goes, I killed a Neil, I buried its guts, spouted a tree, and you got coconuts. Like, I get that, like, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Like, it, it, it became like this tune that got stuck in my head. I attached it to something else. And when I finally returned to the actual words of the prayer, I loved this idea of this prayer being stuck somewhere in my subconscious, in my head, as I went throughout my day. I know that because of the change Jesus has done in my life, that has changed major parts of my life and those around me. And I'm sure it's the same with you. At the beginning of the year, um, uh, in my weekly email, which if you don't get my weekly email, highly suggest you do that. Go to harborcove.church, sign up on the homepage. Um, but at the beginning of the year, I suggested 10 questions to ask yourself in the new year. Number four was, what things did you pray for? It was a question designed to maybe refocus your, your prayer life in 2024. And Lynn Benson, one of our awesome um, leadership team members, replied and gave me permission to share what she wrote because I, I thought it was really good. She wrote, Friends have had failing health or medical issues. Others have had uh, been in failed recovering or reconciling or reeling in relationships. Some prayers have been about my own feelings and how I've felt failed by others. Some prayers have been questions and sorrows, sitting in silence, waiting for the calm of the Lord. And in all of these moments, by moment, issue by issue, day-to-day -day conversations, the best answers are always come to me. 
I have chosen this for you or the other, and you can hold it with me because I am faithful. Or so many other whispers of love that remind me of the greatest treasure, the very presence, person, and shalom of the Most High. So really, that's what I've been praying for because those are the answers, and you can't get any better than that. Lynn has a deep prayer life, and prayer is so much, and her prayer is so much more than a wishing well for her. She's practicing prayer in a way that is allowing herself to be changed by God, and I think she's doing a great job helping lead our church. So thank you, Lynn, for sharing and encouraging us in how to practice prayer. So, so let's explore the actual practicing part of prayer. Like I said, um, next week we have a class that's starting. Um, and it's going to cover these four aspects of prayer, but I'm going to give you the cliff version, cliff notes version right now, um, because even if you don't take the class, I think you can still apply these things to your life. So first we're going to look at the first stage of prayer, which is just talking to God. When the disciples um, asked Jesus, hey, teach us how to pray, he replied, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is the prayer that we pray every Sunday. Now it's the Lord's Prayer. And we use this prayer every week here. It's one of our liturgies or our elements of our worship that we have written out for us to use. And, um, but, but there are more kinds of liturgies that, that, that we can put together, um, such as uh, singing psalms or using a prayer app on our phone. Pre-written stuff is not bad just because it was thought of ahead of time. I think God blesses our work either if it's prepared or if it's spontaneous. And this way of praying can be an incredibly helpful um, thing in various seasons of our lives. When we're learning how to pray, when we're exhausted or when we're sick, when we're having trouble and having a hard time trying to focus, or when we're living with grief and doubt, searching for the right words to talk to God, the prayers of the saints, as some, of, as some people call them, can carry us through. So, so focusing on the, the pragmatics of prayer is important because one of the single most important tasks of being a disciple of Jesus is starting and building the habit and fine-tuning your prayer rhythm. Your daily prayer can be simple and brief, um, as a, uh, but it's as essential as sleeping and eating and drinking. This is what will keep you um, praying in the days and months to years to come. And to create a prayer rhythm, I think you need to ask yourself a couple things. When will I pray? Like morning, afternoon, you pick, it's okay, but a good rule is to give God your best time of day, when you're most uh, aware, and awake. Another question is, where will you pray? It can be incredibly helpful to find a dedicated prayer space, a place that kind of is a modern day altar of sorts, and you go there to open up to God, not because God hears better at an altar, but I think because you do. Um, and the thing, third thing you should ask is, how should I pray? Uh, standing, sitting, walking, kneeling, what's the best posture to get your body to work with your heart? And not against it. And then the third question you should ask is, how long should I pray? And there's no right answer here. Just, just start with what you're able to take as a next step. It could be five minutes. It could be five hours. I know I personally cannot do five hours. Five minutes sounds great. Create a rhythm and then pick out a prayer. You can pray the Jesus prayer over and over. You can pray the Lord's prayer. You can read the Psalms. You can sing a song or use a prayer app, or you can click a button in the chat right now and download this handout that has a bunch of pre-written prayers. The next step then is to fine tune your rhythm and to talk to God. Find a good transition in and out of your prayer time. Maybe it's putting on some good music or lighting a candle or something that transitions your mind and your body into I'm in prayer mode now. Try using your body in prayer too. Try kneeling, try sitting, even try that prostrating thing. I don't know, I'm still sketched about that one. But begin and end your day with gratitude. Find ways to give thanks to God uh, for what you feel he has done and what he's doing now. And this is a safe place to, to take a step into the prayers of petition and intercession. Asking for things out of this context, context is, is where it's at because it began with you opening up to allow God to change you so you can approach certain situations. For example, if I'm going to pray for a need, I have tuned my heart to, open, um, to be open to help meet that need should God open that door. And then as you begin to talk with God, I'll consider these questions. Where do you feel resistance? Like what hinders your ability to engage in prayer? What, um, what in your spirit just isn't right? Or where do you find delight? 
uh, what words or phrases or ideas bring you hope and joy and comfort? And where do you most experience God's nearness? What's working for you when you pray? The third step is listening to God. Now, this is the practice of prayer that I think I need the most growth in because this is the arena that has caused a handful of bad experiences in my prayer life. Because this phrase scares me the most. The Lord told me. I, I am in, an insanely skeptical person, and when I hear people say this, the first thing I think is, did he, though? Um, I've been around people long enough to know that we're really good at convincing ourselves about stuff, even if it's incorrect. And it's most dangerous when we bring God into it. I just watched a video about an online pastor who swindled $1.3 million from his congregation because the Lord told him to quit his marketing job and start a church and have everyone invest in this new cryptocurrency that he created. Shockingly, it didn't work. But he made a video explaining the situation because there are now charges against him. And this is what he says in his video. So the charges are that my wife and I pocketed 1.3 million and I just want to come out and say that those charges are true. So there's 1.3 million that's been taken out. I think it was a total of 3.4 million, but about half of that 1.3, half a million dollars went to the IRS. And here's it. And a few hundred thousand dollars went to a home remodel that the Lord told us to do. Now, let's be clear. I'm not saying that if you feel like the Lord has told you to do something or has revealed something to you, that that's not real. It's just your mind making up stories. But I am asking you, if you feel like the Lord has told you to do something or revealed something to you, just go ahead and make sure. Um, because the last thing the church needs is a bunch of people doing things in the name of the Lord, but the Lord has said no such things. So when you listen to God, how do you check those things that you feel God is speaking to you um, against truth? Like, let's be, let's be clear. When, when people say, I heard a word from the Lord, I, I'm, I, I don't think they actually are talking about an audible voice. God speaks through scripture first and foremost, and it's, it's, and it's only by spending time in scripture that the words and the phrases and the concepts and the convictions and the challenges begin to stand out to you and speak to your heart. And that takes time and commitment. So when you hear a word from the Lord, you can test it against scripture and say, I heard this, but I don't think that's right because I read this. <clears throat> or you can go to someone that you trust and be like, yeah, you, you didn't hear that. I remember when I first started dating Carrie, my wife, she called the house and I picked up the phone and she asked to talk to my mom. I think she was going to ask about my birthday or something, but I did not recognize her voice over the phone. I asked who it was and she goes, it's a friend. And I thought that was weird because um, I still didn't know who it was. And I gave the phone to my mom. It was only after that they hung up that I realized that I did not know the sound of my girlfriend yet. And that was very unfamiliar to me. Now I can pick her voice anywhere, out anywhere, because I've spent tons of time with her and I desire even to hear her voice. It's the same with God. The more time you spend in prayer and reading scripture, um, and more on that next week, the easier it will be to listen to God's voice. As Jesus said in John 10, 27, he says, my sheep listen for my voice. I know them and they follow me. This is a, a spirit-generated desire in the heart of a disciple of Jesus. In Luke 10, 39, um, it was said that Jesus' disciple Mary sat, um, said that she sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. And this is the primary posture of a disciple of Jesus, sitting and listening. But learning to hear is just the beginning. Learning to obey is even greater task. And our attention must be to really listen to God with a heart of loving, surrender, and trust. Now, here's a couple of listening practices Christians have found helpful over the years. Well, just, we'll just talk about one, actually. A very popular one is called Lectio Divina. It's called divine or, or divine reading. It's a practice of reading scripture slowly and repeatedly and prayerfully. You take a passage and you slowly read it and you pay attention to any words or phrases that, that jump out or resonate with you. And then you reread that same passage and you pause over those words that stuck out to you and you meditate on them and, and, you, and you turn them over in your mind. And then you pray your impressions back to God about why those stuck out to you. And then you rest for a few moments in silence and deep breaths. And then you practice this process throughout the week, listening to God. So the fourth step, when we move from talking 
talking to God, talking with God, um, listening to God, and now being uh, with God. Uh, we never mature beyond any of these four stages of prayer that we'll look at this next month. Um, <clears throat> But the further we progress in prayer, the more we desire to speak to God, to listen to God, and to just be with God. As a general rule, you can gauge the intimacy in a relationship by how comfortable you are just being alone together in silence. Early on, relationships are full of words and activity, and as you grow closer, closer over time, there are still lots of words and activity, but also you come to deeply enjoy just being with each other. And in the later stages of prayer, all human metaphors kind of fall short, but the most ancient metaphor is the stage of marriage. Um, that there's a level of intimacy in marriage that's the intermingling of, of two persons at the deepest level, and it's wordless. And yet it is still a form of communication. And this type of wordless prayer that is suggested in, in, our, in our class is uh, it's called contemplation. It's the most, its most basic meaning is to contemplate, to, to look, to gaze upon the beauty of God, to receive his love pouring out towards you in Christ and by the Spirit, and to give your love back in return. And that sounds hard. Um, that sounds very um, mysterious, but it is being still and being silent aren't my strong suits. So this is something that I got to work on. But finding ways to remove distractions is something that I, I feel I'm, I got to work on. I think we all do. Just to be with God and to be still is important. So just remember, prayer is more than a rally monkey, and it's more than just asking for things. And prayer is ultimately more about changing you than changing things. Uh, a millennia ago, King David prayed the Psalm 139. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in a way everlasting. And Trevor Hudson, a scholar, um, has said that we don't change from our experience. We only change when we can reflect on our experience. And I think prayer is the primary way that we do that. So I got three questions for you. The first, how is God changing you through your prayers? Second, when you consider the practice of prayer, how do you, or where do you feel resistance? Where do you feel delight? And where do you most experience God's nearness? And number three, what is your next step when it comes to growing in your prayer life? So as we come to the Lord's table today, this is a great opportunity to remember what Jesus has done for you. This is the table where we remember that Jesus has ransomed us, that he's paid for our sins, for the dumb things that we have done, that that power is broken in our lives, and that he invites us to live into a newness of life. So I invite you to come to this table and repent. Repenting just means to make a decision to live differently to receive the forgiveness of God and the grace of the Holy Spirit to go forward as a different person. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new way of doing things in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, holy and blessed forever, we are so grateful that you stepped down into our worlds. We're so grateful that you saw our worth and our value, even when we were a mess, and that you gave your life so that we might be redeemed, so that we might have a second chance, so that we could be different people. And so, God, we come to you and we confess our sins, we receive your forgiveness, and we pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to live on your mission and to be the people that you have called us to be. God, as we come to this table, may this bread and this cup be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.
Thanks again for joining us this morning. If you'd like us to get to know you a little bit more, there is a button in the chat that you can click on to fill out a contact form. We will be in touch. And if you're ready to take a tiny act of faith, visit harborcove.church. Your next step may just be a few clicks away. There are a few options right on our homepage to check out. Click the Next Steps link in the chat to get started. If you'd like to stay up to date on other things at Harbor Cove, you can sign up for our weekly emails at harborcove.church or you can text Harbor Cove to 55498 to sign up for text updates. As always, if you can't make it in person next week, then we'll see you back here at Harbor Cove online. Now, here's Matt with a benediction. For our benediction this morning, I would love to read to you from Ephesians 3. It's a prayer that Paul has for another group of his friends in the church of Ephesus. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the uh, Lord's holy... Always, I hate this part. Okay, here we go. For a benediction this morning, I would love to share with you the prayer that Paul has for his friends in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 16, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all of the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with to the measure of all of the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power and at work in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.